right. Good morning, everyone. I think this is now the second year that we've done this this time, and we've uh, had similar presentations. And just to give a little bit more of a sense of the way that we think about research, the way that we're using this information, we are an independent consulting firm. We don't manage assets. We help institutions, community foundations, higher ed, state pension plans, uh, on asset allocation, risk management, portfolio construction. And this research helps us manage expectations, think about what to expect in the coming year, help us understand the reasons why the portfolio behaved the way that it did. We also have a very unique perspective, as most consulting firms do, is that in that we work with a wide variety of different investment managers. We meet with thousands of investment managers over the course of any one given year. So we have, and we are viewing their research on an ongoing basis. The better part of uh, January, I spent reading outlooks from a wide variety of different investment managers. They all have a very similar outlook, uh, and a very similar explanation surrounding what happened in 2020. So the research that we use helps us manage expectations, helps us think about what we can expect from por portfolios. And obviously markets will move in very unexpected ways. And having strategic and a long-term <coughs> asset allocation, understanding what your return objective needs to be, whether you're an individual investor working with high net worth clients or large institutions, and understanding what your risk tolerance is. So the way that we've structured this, the way that we've structured it in the past, we have just a, some commentary on economic outlook, what happened in, in 2019, and then views on each of the asset classes that are important to our clients, and I'm sure that are important to your clients, and that's fixed income, U.S. and non-U.S. equity, private real estate, and other private markets. And when we were here last year, uh, 2018 took a very unexpected turn. Um, most of the year had a very promising equity market return, but the Fed probably overstepped when they raised rates four times. And raising rates in a backdrop where there was very limited inflation, the prospect of a trade war, uh, sent investors into a, a massive risk-off appetite. Equity sold off about 20% in December or in the fourth quarter, uh, causing us to have a negative, a negative print for the first time in almost a decade or since 2008 as a result. And that was a little bit unexpected. I think the Fed very clearly, and perhaps there was a little bit of an administrative battle between the Fed chairman and our current president surrounding what he is able or what the Fed is able to do with interest rates. But the message was higher interest rates put significant downward pressure on equities. By contrast, 2019 is the exact opposite story. We have the backdrop of ongoing trade conflict or protectionist policies between the U.S. and China, uh, a backdrop of geopolitical conflict that will never go away, whether it's protests in Hong Kong, Brexit, which is now entering its third year or after its third year, uh, very close to sort of who knows what in the Middle East with, with Iran. But all of that seems to be relatively meaningless for most equity investors. Equity investors have responded very favorably to Decrease in interest rate of about 75 basis points. December 2015, interest rates increased in lockstep uh, by about or nine different times, 25 basis points each, and then pulled back pretty significantly this year. And that is probably the single most biggest driver of equity market returns, especially in the United States, is lower interest rates. Lower interest rates have led to much better equity market returns. Just a quick snapshot, this says U.S. economy, uh, of sort of what happened in 2013. <laughs> 4Q GDP, or just an overall measure of uh, domestic growth, 2.3%. And we've basically been in a period of relatively low economic growth for quite some time. That's largely attributable to just a slower, slower or declining demographic. Uh, baby boomers are exiting the workforce. Millennials are now in the workforce. Uh, but there's still a significant amount of wage compression. We haven't seen the same level of wage expansion that typically accompanies very low levels of unemployment. We are at a 50-year low with respect to unemployment, but wage expansion has not accompanied that. Part of the reason that we have not yet seen any sort of massive overheating of inflation is measured by CPI, uh, or core CPI. And that's also part of the reason why the Fed has stepped back their, their interest rates. There is no real measurable risk across any developed or even emerging market or economy of economies overheating. And the two big, obviously, initiatives that we're watching, uh, articles of impeachment, which doesn't seem to have much of an impact on overall market in, or sort of market performance. Uh, what will be a little bit more meaningful is what happens in the 2020 election and whether or not we have progressive policies from a new administration and what those implications are in equity markets. 
Then, of course, the big news this morning, phase one uh, has been signed or is being signed this morning, which basically agrees to China buying $200 billion worth of goods and services over the course of the next two years, which roughly is across ag products, pork and soybeans, which has a big meaning here in the Midwest and uh, Southern Illinois, across energy, automotives, manufacturing. And in return, the U.S. will not impose any more uh, tariffs on China. And I should add, if, if you have questions throughout, please interrupt and I'll do my best to answer whatever's on your mind. Uh, so obviously a, rela a relaxed position with protectionist policies, with tariffs, with trade rhetoric, will certainly carry favor in the minds of equity investors. This has been a risk on environment. We should expect to see more investors welcoming this, this agreement. This has been a, a, more of a drag on emerging markets than anything else, more of a drag on uh, developed Europe than anything else. So this should open the doors a little bit in uh, US equity markets. Um, so in terms of overall forecasts, almost across the board, the expectations in 2019, uh, which were revised sort of in April, um, relatively lackluster, whether it's in a developed market or even in China, which for years and years has exhibited almost double-digit growth, mm -hmm. is, is really walked back. Uh, China has probably been more impacted than the U.S. with respect to economic growth as a result of these trade tariffs. And then emerging markets and other South Asian uh, peripheral countries have been impacted as well. Um, developed Europe is has really experienced probably the biggest drag on equity markets worldwide. Developed Europe has seen a deterioration in demographics, more and more folks exiting the workforce, uh, immigration policies that aren't necessarily as favorable as the ones that we have in the U.S. And so we really have seen sort of slow and stagnant growth and coupled with uh, sort of socialist policies in some countries in the backdrop of Brexit has caused slower growth in, in most developed European countries. Um, what you can't see here on this graphic is I mean, these gray bars that illustrate periods of recession. And the purpose of this slide is to illustrate that there are instances, almost repeatable, where we see following high levels of unemployment, we see a recession that normally follows. Every time we see that spike in grain, followed by that sharp decline with the natural level of unemployment in the blue line. And that's typically because the economy starts to overheat, there's no slack in the economy, wages expand, more people are working, and then the Fed puts their brakes on the economy by rising rates. Recessions, which was kind of a concern mid-year is the yield curve inverted, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, recessionary pressures will cause the Fed to, or I'm sorry, uh, inflationary pressures will cause the Fed to increase interest rates. And the purpose of just illustrating this, we've had very healthy uh, levels of employment over the course of the last kind of five years, and that could cause the Fed to increase interest rates. Now, the likelihood of that happening, at least in the next year, seems to be pretty unlikely. Um, recession odds have dropped, and this is a graph or a metric that's created by the New York Fed. It is based almost exclusively on the shape of the yield curve. When the yield curve inverts, that has been highly predictive of a recession. And we can see that really in those past instances following the dot-com and of course right around the global financial credit crisis. Um, the, the inversion was a relatively short-lived phenomenon. We'll talk about that in just a minute, but obviously short-term rates were longer than sort of medium-term rates and then it was upward sloping from the intermediate period on. But that has been highly predictive of recessions in the past. Now, whether or not it is this time remains to be seen. We have a few metrics on what to possibly expect following that yield curve inversion. Um, trade with China, obviously that has had an impact on the overall economy to a certain extent, but other countries have picked up that slack, whether it's Mexico, Vietnam, or other South Asian countries, have sort of filled the imports that we've been taking from the world and the exports to the rest of the world. So we've seen a drop in terms of our commerce and dealings with China to the tune of around 10%, but that's been quickly filled by other uh, other economies that have an appetite for our goods and services. Um, reduced dependence on the Middle East. I think this is interesting for a number of different reasons, but it potentially impacts the way that we think about geopolitics in the Middle East. Probably comes as no surprise that our involvement in that region for years and years was largely due to oil, despite whatever sort of message the rest of the media delivers. 
the fact that they had a tremendous amount of oil was very important to us. We were becoming much more energy independent as a result of hydraulic fracking and sourcing natural gas uh, and other fossil fuels in other ways. We are less dependent on what happens with oil supply um, in the Middle East. So that could potentially impact the way that we think about our military presence, our geopolitical presence, nothing sort of imminent, uh, but obviously geopolitics weighs heavily on the minds of investors and the fear and our ability to take on equity market risk. Consumer fundamentals, one other big driver of the economy or markets this year, protectionist policies had a major dent in corporate confidence, not necessarily understanding what will have, have or what will occur with China and trade relations left most companies skeptical in terms of CapEx, new spending, new development. But the American consumer has been very, very healthy. They're earning more, they're working. We did see a massive uptick, as you would expect, with auto loan, credit card, mortgage, uh, delinquency. Student loans is obviously a very, a very challenging uh, sort of theme. But we are seeing a modest upswing in these levels of delinquency versus where we were in sort of 2015, 2016. Not necessarily concerning, but it is interesting that American households are earning more, they're working more, yet there's still this upswing in delinquencies. I don't necessarily think we need to read too much into that. It's just an interesting observation given the backdrop of how healthy American consumers really are. So fixed income, uh, when you think about fixed income, we think about a portfolio balance. This is the asset class in portfolios, whether it's high net worth in in individuals, community foundations, state pension plans that serve as the buffer for when equity markets go awry. And in 2018, that didn't work particularly well. We saw an environment where equity sold off depending on the, the index, four to five percent, and bonds were flat. Normally, we expect more negative or lower correlation between those asset classes. Equity just goes down, bonds go up. If we have an environment where you have four rate hikes or 100 basis points in any one year, that has a negative impact on fixed income. Now in 2019, that's a completely different story. Equity markets rallied, depending again on the index, almost 30%, and bonds posted in this year-to-date column or one-year column, equity-like returns. Core fixed income at the very top, almost 9%. Government bonds, long-term government bonds, almost 15%. One of the safest assets that any investor can hold return 15%. That is, that doesn't happen very often. And then if we think about longer term credit, you see returns that are even more favorable. Uh, emerging market debt is another asset class that's done reasonably well. So those investors, especially a 60-40 portfolio, in fact, this is probably one of the best years any 60-40 portfolio has ever had. Just simply being in public markets was the best way for investors to source return, despite the fact that most institutional investors have access or allocations to real estate, private equity, private credit. So what drove that return? And it really comes down to interest rates. The 10-year, uh, sort of in the middle, year over year in 2018, but from the end of 2018 to the end of September, the 10-year fell about 100 basis points. And for a duration of about 4% in core fixed income, 4 or 5%, you would expect to see a 5% increase in fixed income. So the fact that interest rates came down so dramatically over a relatively short-term period of time really was instrumental in driving up equity market returns. The, the connection between interest rates and U.S. equities, non-U.S. equities, and fixed income is pretty staggering. This was a big driver of why we saw such healthy returns. Uh, so what inversion? Um, we saw a peak inversion in 2000, 2006, and obviously we, we recall those consequences pretty significantly. There was a recession. The inversion uh, was relatively short-lived at the time of this printing it, it all but disappeared. So the inversion really occurred kind of between that zero and 10 year mark. And part of the reason that this is not always as highly predictive as, as some people think is what's happening along with the curve. Normally sovereign wealth investors, large institutional invest investors, pension plans uh, hold or have historically held about $2 trillion in US treasury. That number over the course of the last seven years has increased from about 2 trillion to six or 7 trillion. That tremendous bond buying pressure on the long end of the curve has boosted uh, long-term bond prices, but have put interest rates down. So if we had an environment, and, and the reason being, they look in their home country, yields in Europe and other developed markets are low, even negative. So the benefit of holding their own debt is sort of prohibitive when, they, when thinking about what they're trying to accomplish. So U.S. long-term government debt has been a very attractive trade for many investors as evidenced by this increase in ownership. 
So that has put perhaps some unnecessary pressure on the long end of the curve. If there wasn't that significant amount of bond bond, we probably would have a downward <coughs> sloping curve. But in the past, this has been a predictor of recessionary environments. Whether or not it happens this year, <coughs> or this time remains to be seen. Uh, but that's a metric that, of course, many investors follow up top. So, Dave, is there a structural reason why those investors don't move from long-term to short-term bonds in an environment like we've seen so far this year? Is that asset liability matching? What What's going on? Yeah, so that would be my guess. So, so the question is, why are they? So, you're, why would you hold a long-term bond versus an intermediate-term bond and take on that duration risk when the interest rate or the yield between the two is relatively small? And I think that the general answer is that is the best way to align liabilities with assets. Holding uh, you know, retired lives or, or some sort of liability matching is more aligned with 15 years and longer. That one, I think that's the most reasonable explanation. So the expectation on, on interest rates, and this is based on Fed funds futures that can be tracked uh, very easily, very closely. And at the time of this printing, which was January 7th, the expectation is no change in interest rates when the Fed meets again at this month, which I think is probably uh, what we would all expect. The likelihood of the next rate cut comes in November 2020. Um, you know, whether or not that happens remains to be seen. That's something the Fed will address sometime throughout the course of the year. Most of the material that I've seen suggests perhaps one cut in 2020, but not much more. Um, and the reason being, we're still right around that 2% inflationary rate, despite the fact that we have the lowest levels of unemployment in, in 50 years. We haven't seen massive levels of inflation for whatever reason, but a lot of that is attributable to weight or limited amount of wage expansion. So unless we see meaningful change in inflation, we probably won't see much action on behalf of the Fed. U.S. equities, of course, U.S. equities, uh, non-U.S. equities, private equity, these are the sources of growth in portfolios. This is the asset class that allows investors to achieve a target return of 7.5 or higher. This is the growth mechanism. Of course, this comes with a significant amount of volatility. And the returns in U.S. equities, as everybody in this room knows, was, was great. Um, you know, 31% from large cap, uh, large cap growth, even more attractive, 36.4%. Where we saw and continue to see a little bit of a disconnect is the difference between small cap and large cap value and growth. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But there's a significant difference between those investors that have a, a, a market overweight to U.S. small cap. When we think about uh, broad capitalization, whether it's the Russell 1000, the Wilshire 5000, the <coughs> Russell 3000, generally speaking by market cap, small and mid <coughs> represents around 10%. Large cap represents around... 90%. So those investors, and over the years, there tends to be a small cap premium. So those investors that have an overweight to small cap or an overweight to value to try to capture some of that premium have not fared as well. Now, over the long term, that may be different. We'll talk about some of the reasons why small cap has not fared as well. Um, but this is just an interesting observation. Now, we did see some level of resurgent with uh, value over, over the last month of the year, but that seems to be pretty short-lived. Um, and, and it's really been driven, this is an important point, this has been driven by multiple expansion, just a tremendous amount of risk on buying of assets, driving up prices, and not being driven by earnings growth. Uh, the earnings estimates for the year, this time last year for 2019, were around 7.5%, and that came down to uh, finish the year with earnings growth of around 2.5%, largely driven again by protectionist policies. So the equity market returns in 2019 we're not driven by earnings expansion, which is a little bit of a concern because that's leading to massively over valuations that are at or near historical levels. Um, best year for U.S. equities, uh, our fourth best year for U.S. equities in the last 30 years. Of course, 2018 was one of the worst. 2019 was one of the best. Uh, the late 90s, of course, was driven by the dot-com bus or the dot-com boom followed by the bus in 2013. Um, just to illustrate sort of where this stacks up over the course of the last 30 years. Now, it's always interesting to illustrate, too, and this is probably more impactful in a year like last year than this year. So this is a illustration of calendar year returns for the S&P 500 dating back to 2006. Calendar year return in that beige bar. The blue dot represents uh, a drawdown. Any drawdown more than 10% is viewed as a correction. 
every single year, and if you were to take this back even further, there is a drawdown. A correction of 10% occurred in eight out of the last 14 years. In eight out of the last 14 years, equity markets sold off by 10% or more. And for, for a few years, there was one every year. Yet in those years, we only saw two negative calendar year returns. So this could be a useful slide, especially if you're dealing with individuals who have different levels of risk tolerance and giving them the assurance that while this happens, this is a normal phenomenon. We can't expect equity level returns without taking on this level of risk. And this can be reassuring for investment committees, individual <coughs> investors. This is a common occurrence. Um, and then the other part to this is just what happens when you remain invested. Institutional investors, high net worth investors should, should have an investment policy, should have a target to certain asset classes. And staying within those, those bounds and maintaining that discipline usually leads to positive outcomes. Financial crisis, equity markets sold off 55%, but the cumulative return since then is almost 500%. And then there's evidence that shows across every single major downturn since 2009, very strong benefits of re remaining invested in equity markets. So when you're thinking about volatility, thinking about risk, knowing what to withstand, it really should become an argument around liquidity. How much liquidity do you need or do your clients need during periods of equity market sell-offs? If it's none, stay invested as, as, as much as possible and the benefits usually over the long term are worth it as evidenced by these most recent equity market sell-offs. Uh, technology sector, probably not a big surprise, but tech has been the biggest contributor to equity market returns, uh, sort of globally, but definitely here in the United States. Uh, in fact, the only market segment or the uh, classification segments within the S&P 5, the posted mm -hmm. return of less than, I think, 10% was energy. Everything else has done remarkably well. Now, part partially due to massive inflows into passively managed funds. Tech represents the biggest sector, the biggest segment of the S&P 500. More and more capital flows in. You see more and more money allocated to the tech sector. To put this in a little bit more, uh, or more specifically, there are four segments in particular, tech hardware and equipment, software services, semiconductors, and sort of biotech that really drove returns, especially in the large cap space. So those four sectors in particular have been largely responsible for the equity market returns. Now, think about what can potentially happen if there is tech regulation. Administrative change or administration change in 2020, this could happen very quickly. And we think about the balance between value and growth. That mean reversion can occur very, very quickly. And if you have a bias towards value and you're thinking about migrating back to growth, it's very difficult to get in front of that timing. So something like tech regulation or antitrust, which could have the biggest impact on the tech sector or perhaps these four sectors, could send capital flowing in the complete opposite direction, which is something to be mindful of is we think about a style bias in your clients' portfolios, our clients' portfolios. And even more specifically, the largest contributors, Apple, it doesn't come as much of a surprise, now represents almost three and a half percent of the S&P 5. I think the share price has probably doubled in the last calendar year, followed by Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon. JP Morgan, the largest bank in the United States, just posted uh, very healthy earnings two days ago. Uh, is the only sort of non-technology firm um, among this group of largest contributors. So in terms of underlying factors, so we've, we've spent a little bit of time talking about sectors. These are the factors that are most commonly uh, associated with return. And this has really been the same message over the course of the last five years. Growth has dominated, small and value uh, have, have been penalized, and we typically associate yield uh, with value stocks. So those investors who are looking for income, looking for additional sources of of yield in their portfolios have been hurt as value stocks or yield stocks have sold off. Now this can change very quickly as we'll see in another slide. Um, actually before we get to that, so small caps, small cap stocks tend to be more, more insulated from uh, supplier diversification, different access to credit, different access to buyers. They tend to have less pricing power, more margin compression, less ability to negotiate with suppliers. And so that's part of the reason that we've seen uh, a relative price to earnings deteriorate relative to large cap stocks. Now, over time, we have been able to observe a small cap premium. Now, part of that small cap premium is migrating to private markets, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So as the private equity premium, or the private market, sorry, the small cap premium 
in public markets disappearing. That certainly it appears to be so if we look uh, across the last few years. Uh, but as a result of the sell-off in the small cap space, there represents some value opportunities across U.S. non-U.S. equities. Russell uh, 2000, which is small cap, or micro, micro cap stocks are in correction territory, but also represent the most attractive buying opportunities. It's just when will that mean reversion occur? If we think about value versus growth, this is the phenomenon that seems to have lingered or has been lingering for uh, the better part of the last decade. Dating back to 1936, the U.S. value premium over growth has been noticeable and measurable. Uh, we did see an element of mean reversion follow, or just prior to the, the tech bubble. With, it, with tr a tremendous amount of just capital and lower interest rates has dramatically impacted this usual balance or this usual value premium. So this is one of the longest periods of 70 years where value stocks, stocks that are traded at a discount relative to their intrinsic value, have been undervalued relative to growth. But when this snaps back, as many value investor managers will tell you, it snaps back very quickly. It's very difficult to get in front of this mean reversion, but it's certainly becoming very long in the tooth and problematic for those investors or clients who've had a value bias in the portfolio. Uh, when we think about portfolio construction and the access to asset classes that institutional investors have, the nuance of value versus growth core sort of becomes irrelevant. We think about allocating to equities, and then really <clears throat> gaining yield from fixed income diversification, access to private markets, real estate, private credit, private equity. So we, we spend less time thinking about the nuance of value versus growth because it's so hard to get right. Now, if you're working with individual investors that may not have access to private markets, this becomes a little bit more important. The value versus growth phenomenon, as many of you may know, has, has been a little bit of a, a struggle. Uh, so in terms of valuation, Almost across the board, whether it's large cap, mid cap, large cap or mid cap, valuations are testing historical levels in the 80th, 90th percentile relative to a wider variety of metrics, whether it's price to earnings, price to sales. But as I mentioned earlier, small cap, micro cap stocks are in a period of correction. And that represents some of the most attractive buying opportunities depending on what metric you use. But when will that, when will that change? When will we see some sort of abatement in the protectionist policies. That's going to be a driver of this element of mean reversion. Um, so in terms of being in a slower or slow GDP environment, we typically see, at least over these time periods, healthier equity market returns. And the reason being, the Fed's usually accommodated and lowers interest rates. During periods of slower growth or late cycle, like the one that we're in right now, we tend to see lower interest rates. Lower interest rates drive equity market returns. How long will this last? It remains to be seen, but it certainly is helpful and reassuring um, when we are in this late cycle and the Fed has been as accommodated as possible. Now, political infighting, of course, we're all thinking about what the impeachment and the administration change or potential administration change will have on, on equity markets, and our research team has tried to figure that out. The result is basically inconclusive, but in the last <laughs> instances, which is, that's a consulting term. <laughs> um, so there's been three instances in modern history where there's been uh, impeachment proceedings, of course, with Nixon, but that was right in the throes of um, kind of high levels of inflation, early stages of oil embargo, gas shortage shortages. So it's not much of a surprise that equity markets perform poorly. By contrast, uh, Clinton years, these were the middle of the dot-com boom. The internet phenomenon drove equity market prices. So there's very, it's very difficult to glean any sort of logical conclusion from impeachment proceedings. But coming back to the yield curve inversion, this is kind of fascinating. So these are the instances where the inversion started, the recession start date, the months until recession, and the return for the period. So on average, dating back to the 1980s, where we had a measurable inversion period from that inversion to the start of recession, if one did occur, was almost two years. So if we are anticipating a recession based on the reversion that occurred in the third quarter, we're basically looking at another 18 months if, if one occurs at all. And the return for that time period of recession or inversion to recession start date was north of 20%. So very attractive markets do typically occur in the meantime. I would also, I would argue though that the predictability or the predictive uh, 
use of the most recent occur inversion is relatively low because of the phenomenon that we discussed earlier. Um, so it doesn't. It, so the threat is not always in it. Non-U.S. equities. Non-U.S. equities have obviously performed well, but not as well as what we've seen in the United States. Uh, global equity at the top, global equity X U.S. Really, where we see sort of the most concern or the most disappointing performance comes from emerging markets. Still up 18 percent, but that's almost you know a thousand basis points below what we earn from the United States, and that's largely due to protectionist policies, trade conflict, and also impacted was with small cap. Uh, Emerging market, small cap. So emerging market economies more impacted than the United States uh, by trade conflict with China. Active managers. I'm, I'm not sure how much time you spend with your clients thinking about active management, passive management, but this has been, uh, we, we're, we continue to see more and more market efficiency. The price discovery process is much faster. Uh, distribution of information is symmetric. There's a democratization of information. Everybody has access to the same information. It can ultimately lead to the same conclusions, which is why we've seen so much money pour into uh, index funds versus active management. But that was not the case in 2019. Active managers, as measured by this particular universe, outperformed their benchmark, which is very rewarding to see if you were an investment manager. And of course, active managers come with higher fees, uh, but that has outperformed the basic benchmark. But that doesn't take away from the long-term expectation around market, efi or market efficiencies. The access to information in public markets will continue to improve. The price discovery process will continue to improve, and volatility is really sourced through investor behaviors. Um, we've talked about this a little bit already, but in the U.S. and across the globe, with I think the exception of uh, Japan, we expect to see lower economic growth in almost every single major market. And it's largely due to shifting demographics. We are seeing more and more people exit the workforce. Uh, we will see more folks, uh, more perhaps favorable immigration policies to change this outlook. But the expectation is relatively low for economic growth. Uh, contractionary size as measured by the PMI, which is the Producers Manufacturing Index. And the general reading is anything below 50 signals recessionary or cautionary tones or contractionary tones versus expansion. And every single developed market is exhibiting some level of contraction. Now, a portion of this, or a large portion of this, is due to protectionist policies and the uncertainty that comes with not knowing what to expect when the two largest economies in the world go at it. This may revert back to expansion once we see more clarity once we move past phase one, but this certainly isn't a very appealing tale when we're thinking about global growth. Uh, in Germany, of course, the largest economy in Europe was very close to the brink of a technical recession, two consecutive uh, quarters of lower or negative growth. Uh, they, they avoided uh, technical or textbook definition of recession, but obviously the largest economy in Europe has experienced a slow growth uh, in the rest of the Euro zone. Uh, manufacturing, as evidenced by this slide, continues to contract. Uh, not much of a surprise, but we are migrating more towards a service economy, and we do continue to see some level of expansion within services. Um, we are moving, we are, we've moved to a service-based economy in the U.S., and more and more developed market or countries and economies are expanding into services, and services have been uh, sort of ballast for overall economic growth. Now, central banks across the globe have cut rates in recognition of the fact that global growth is slowing. And the, the, this is an interesting metric or number that I read earlier. Um, 40 central banks across the globe cut rates 63 times for a cumulative interest rate cut of 3,000 basis points. When you have that level of lower interest rates, that is going to boost global economies, which is exactly what we've seen. <laughs> Now, the sustainability of monetary policy only lasts so long. We really need to see some level of fiscal change, fiscal policy adjustment to gain uh, earnings growth within equities. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about wage growth. We are starting to see, as evidenced by the light blue dotted line and the dark blue dotted line, wage growth expanding. It's just not moving at the same rate with which we would expect to see following a 
and our unemployment has come down significantly, we've only seen a more modest upswing in, um, in wage expansion. And that's largely due to the skills that employees have and the skills that employers need. And to the extent that that grid, one of the last readings I saw, basically a million unfilled jobs in the United States, is that gap gets squeezed uh, as the slack continues to get eliminated in the U.S. economy, we will continue to see more upward wage expansion. And the upward wage expansion should lead to inflationary pressures and, of course, cause the Fed to increase rates. Um, emerging market countries, so this is basically the, uh, the goods exported as a percentage of GDP, much higher for emerging markets, or the one that we profile here, Mexico, Korea, Taiwan, versus the U.S. We only ex export 8% of our goods as a percentage of GDP to um, uh, our global. So what's happening in the United States, the likelihood of a slowdown has much more of an, of an impact on emerging markets and more specifically Mexico, Korea, Taiwan. And then in terms of valuations, we see very, again, we see very rich valuations across, uh, develop, or across non-US markets, not as high, uh, IFA, which is basically a developed market benchmark, uh, 76 percentile versus the U.S. for large cap stocks, which is the 88th percentile uh, in terms of, of uh, historical PE. So there are some opportunities in non-U.S. small cap, emerging market small cap, but still we see very rich valuations across the globe. Now, in real estate, yes? When you're comparing PE ratios like that, though, isn't there some kind of adjustment or normalization for interest rates? If you take a capital asset pricing model type of view, you know, from a discounted cash flow type of perspective, if we're at long term low interest rates, compared to a PE ratio from the late 70s and 19, early 1980s and a 10 or 12% rate, those aren't quite apples to apples. Right? No, they're not, but it, it is a comparable metric. And you could certainly make an argument that with lower interest rates, those multiples can continue to, continue to expand. I think in terms of making a comparison across different segments or different regions, that's somewhat telling. But, you're, but interest rates are low across the globe. Interest rates in China um, slightly higher than what we have here in the United States. That can make a little bit of a difference. But low interest rates are certainly going to be accretive to stock market prices. So, so using that as a metric for, okay, we're rich, it's time to sell, may not necessarily be as useful as it has been in the past. Uh, so real estate, and when we're referring to real estate here, we're referring to private market real estate, but more specifically core real estate. Core real estate basically segmented into the coasts, uh, the major markets, major markets, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, um, Arizona, Manhattan, D.C. We don't tend to see much institutional presence in the um, uh, so this is interesting. That is mislabeled. I just noticed. The Midwest and West are flip flop. The footprint of institutional investors in the uh, Midwest is much, much lower. So we tend to see much more property, much more developed development in the East and the Midwest. When we think about property types, there's basically four in the core space industrial property, apartments, retail, and office. And retail, of course, has been one of the hardest hit. We continue to see downward pressure in the overall allocation of retail space, uh, as, we, as you would expect. I mean, the behaviors, the habits of consumers has changed. We are ordering things online. We are not going to stores. Large box stores have been, uh, have been challenged. Now, what is interesting, though, is the way that the industrial space is reacting. Fulfillment centers, warehouses um, tend to have higher ceilings. They need to have higher bays. If you have larger shelves, you need thicker concrete. So you're seeing more and more industrial space being built near transportation centers to accommodate the way that households have, have changed their, their buying perspective. So we see uh, a decline in retail, we're seeing an increase in industrial space. Uh, multifamily apartments tend to have the shortest duration, a lease of basically a year. So as interest rates are changing, leases changes, this has probably the best way to impact the overall duration in a real estate portfolio. Um, when we think about real estate, we think about the two benchmarks at the top, the Mikri Property Index and the Mikri Fund Index, which is a universe of core open-ended uh, real estate managers. Principal in Des Moines, of course, is a manager that 
that operates in this uh, in this in this channel. And what's noticeable or interesting about real estate uh, performance is the consistency of income. We think about fixed income as a portfolio as a way to add, or fixed income in your portfolio as a way to add income, relatively low yields. By contrast, real estate has offered an income over the last 10 years, it's almost twice from what we're getting from core bonds. Now the appreciation levels have, or the appreciation has leveled off as we've seen price points expand. Um, but what we typically expect from real estate is diversification and an income benefit. And not surprisingly, as I mentioned earlier, industrial was one of the best performers in the last year, right in the middle, and then retail, one of the worst performers. Retail sector continues to see contraction in year over year, same sales, net operating income, uh, again, not a surprise. And then rent controls, especially in markets that you would expect, the West Coast, areas of the East Coast, Chicago, <coughs> can limit the returns that you would expect to get from multifamily now, lastly, we'll turn our attention to private markets, and we continue to see more and more institutional investor appetite for private markets as the need to fulfill a target rate of return of 7.5% for a public pension plan uh, or some sort of spend or return over a spending policy. More investors have migrated to private markets. Private markets represent historically a premium over public markets of three to 400 basis points. You expect to earn 7% going forward from U.S. equities. The expectation for private equity is kind of low single digits. So we see more capital moving into the space. The asset class is maturing. Funds are getting larger. But over the long term, 20 years, uh, that, is, that has held to be true. And so we think about the disappearance of the small cap premium in public markets. That is transitioning to private markets. Public com or companies are going public longer. Uh, small companies are being bought by a fund, sold to a larger fund. The fund raising, uh, or funds are raising billion dollar funds, $20 billion funds, and we continue to see small private companies stay private for longer. Perhaps putting a dent in the small cap premium in public markets, there's a small cap premium that exists within private markets. And so when we compare uh, at the very top, the Cambridge Associates US Private Equity Index, across most long-term time periods, we do see a benefit relative to public equity performance. And this just gives a snapshot of the underlying sectors within private market. This is private market performance by sector. And we've all seen this sort of elemental chart across publicly traded asset classes. And the same, the same view here is the one that we can take away from public markets, is this is a random walk. It's very difficult to predict with any sort of accuracy which segments or which sectors will do well. But what we can tell is that energy lately has been challenged. <coughs> energy has been one of the poor performing public sectors. That's also been true in the private sector. Uh, information technology, consumer staples, business services all have very positive net IRR over the long term. And a diversified approach in private equity tends to be one of the best ways to access the space. And the returns uh, across every period are, are very attractive. Now, what's all, so the reason why, why are we seeing more and more appetite, more and more opportunity in private markets is because the number of public market companies continues to contract. 20 years ago, the number of public market companies was almost 7,000. 7,000 stocks were held in Wilshire 5,000. Due to the increased regulation, the burden of being public, the transparency requirements, we've seen companies just disappear. They've been acquired, they've been de they've delisted, they've gone private. By contrast, the number of companies that are backed by institutional private capital over that same time period has increased from 1,600 to over 7,700. The, the opportunity set to hold private companies continues to increase as the marketplace matures. Now that also creates some compression around what we can expect to earn, higher valuations, higher, higher entry prices, limits the return that we can potentially source, but the opportunity set is much, much larger um, in the private space. Now, large funds continue, the large funds continue to raise, uh, or the historically large funds have continued to raise large, large amounts of capital. Um, dry powder across the space is in excess of almost $600 million in mega funds that have over a billion dollars raised. And when we think about private equity, especially for our clients and our investors, we tend to focus on the small and medium funds where the amount of fundraising has been relatively limited and consistent.
Larger or smaller fund sizes leads to more attractive valuations, not chasing deals, not being obligated to put money to work. We think about CalPERS, uh, large pension system in California that has perhaps a 300 or $300 billion fund with a $300 million target for private equity. They're writing big checks and chasing big deals. By contrast, we think about the allocation that this foundation is making in the private market space, not chasing these big deals, can be nimble, can participate in some of the, some of the deals that are going to be more attractive at the price. So when we think about overvaluation, we've spent some time talking about valuation metrics in the public markets. We think about all this money that's flowing into the private, private space. There is still a very attractive valuation opportunity as evidenced by the gray bar, which is the average middle market uh, transaction of the average middle market deal and the Russell 3000, the public market equivalent. Uh, it's roughly 27% more attractive based on these metrics in terms of the overall valuation. Valuations are lofty, yes, but they're not necessarily as lofty in the private market space. Um, now, private credit, this is an asset class that has been around for a while. We're starting to see more and more managers move into the space, more and more managers raise these funds. And the reason being, we see, we talked a little bit about public companies exiting the space. A lot of those companies were regional banks. The number of banks over the course of the last almost 25 years has decreased from, call it 11,000 down to 5,000. The number of regional banks in the United States has basically been cut by more than, more than half. But there is still a need for financing. There is still a need for private companies to grow their business, to pay their people, to finance their products. So the appetite for financing, lending, and private credit has not disappeared despite the fact that the number of banks or traditional lenders have perhaps forever left the market. So there is an appetite for private credit. Private credit is an asset class that's finding its way into public pension plans that need some sort of liquidity premium, but don't have the stomach for a longer term J curve. Private credit tends to have a premium to fixed income. The yields can be anywhere depending on the leverage from seven to as high as say 12 or 15% with a period that recycle with a shorter uh, recycling of capital. So private credit is an emerging, not an emerging asset class, but an asset class more and more investors are thinking about is a complement to relatively low yields from public funds because of this structural phenomenon. We think about structural phenomena and the impact that they have on capital markets, and this is certainly one. Private lenders or traditional lenders have uh, left the marketplace. And as a result, we're seeing increased instances of private market AUM under management over the course of the last decade. Uh, that's, that's obviously more than doubled. As more and more investors become comfortable with the asset class, uh, but obviously as more uh, managers launch funds, uh, it becomes difficult to track down deals. It becomes tra difficult to find those opportunities without throwing money after potentially bad, bad deals, and we are in a late cycle. So it's just something to be mindful of as you're thinking about other asset classes. Private credit is a way to increase yield, uh, but it definitely comes with some, some due diligence requirements. Those are the end of my prepared comments. I'm happy to take questions and try to answer anything that's on your mind or on the minds of your clients. Yes, sir. So they, since there's a lot less regulation in private equity, um, is there maybe more risk um, in that? Because it's not like you're just building up a prospectus. Yeah, it, it, that's absolutely right. And it's, and it's, hard, it's harder for um, boards and investment committees to conduct their due diligence. And it's not an asset class for everybody because of these risks. Now the marketplace is becoming much more mature. The, private, the discovery process, the valuation process is, um, has improved. And that also creates a dilution of return opportunity. But there is risk. Uh, there's risk of failure and there's risk of illiquidity, which is why it's not an asset class for everybody. The cash flow positive organization uh, with tremendous amounts of liquidity should have a high, the highest allocation of private markets as a way to improve their return. The cash flows, or cash constrained public pension plan like all of them in Illinois have a hard time investing in that asset class despite the fact that that's the asset class they should be in to grow returns. So yes, there, there is a risk return <coughs> premium that's associated with private equity. Dave, going back to this phase one agreement with China, mm -hmm. uh, 
my understanding is the administration is saying that's worth about $200 billion. That's right. <clears throat> and $50 billion of that is supposed to be agricultural products. That's right. However, China has never purchased more than about $26 billion in agricultural products in yeah. the United States, even when we were on good terms without tariffs. Is that realistic? You think that they're going to all of a sudden double? Are you suggesting that China blind us? <laughs> um, well, somebody is. Yeah, somebody is. So the, the numbers that I jotted down from this morning, I think it was, it was 35 million to ag products. Um, it, so yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a real possibility. I think that they have been mindful of their negotiations. They're aware of what could potentially happen with a, a change of administration, although uh, whatever power is in, in the office in, in November may use that as a, a sticking point. But I think that the it's, it's, it's right to be cautious when we think about the merits of this particular deal. Um, and much of that beyond phase one is largely undefined. Anything else? What would it take for regulators to start focusing on private equities to try to regulate that part of the market? Yeah, so it's the, it's the limited amount of transparency, it's the inefficiency that creates the opportunity. Um, and we, we probably wouldn't see that level of regulation unless individual investors were able to access that part of the market. And obviously you have to have certain 25 million in, in wealth to access private markets because then you're labeled as an institutional investor that has the ability to conduct that level of due diligence. Um, and if we see an increased level of regulation, we would expect that illiquidity premium to probably disappear. I would find it unlikely that we would continue to see the same. And, and these, these are you know, companies that are not exchange traded. Um, so that's going to be part of that regulation oversight. I think it would be years to see a meaningful level of regulation that would cause that to go away. Now, of course, uh, Warren has, has her thoughts around private equity carry. Um, and that, that's the catalyst for economic growth. I mean, we have a very innovative economy here in the United States as evidenced by our very lofty equity market returns and how that sort of, and how Europe pales in comparison. We have a mechanism for allocating capital to innovative companies. We have strong universities. And I think it would be unnecessary to regulate that away. now. The debate. I was on a plane last night and didn't get to hear uh, the debates, but there's a few candidates that would like to sort of change our approach to capitalism. Um, and that's, I think all of that is part and parcel. Increased regulation in private markets would, would perhaps deteriorate that incubation and growing process that's been so critical to our economy. Maybe we're right at the 45 minute mark-ish. There was one other slide. Um, Nikki, did you want to say something? Yeah. Oh, yes, Scott. Real quick, Dave. Um, <clears throat> someone else we heard speak said, suggested that um, back to the Fed and this interplay with the, in an election year, that uh, the Fed is, doesn't want to really monkey with raising rates during an election year. Uh, or if they were going to do it, they would do it early in the year, not you know, in the second half of the year. Do, do you, anything that you would say about that? Yeah, so it, it, the, the independence of the Fed and uh, sort of the, the administration is, is part of what's so dear about the way that our economy works. Um, we saw a lot of that sort of interaction, and we continue to see it, but especially in 2018. And President Trump made it very clear that he wanted to see rates lower. And you wonder if Jerome Powell, that was his way of saying, I can do whatever I want. And they hiked rates another time in December and very quickly realized that that was probably the wrong thing to do. I think it would be very difficult for that independence to be meaningfully compromised. Um, but if there is a situation where we continue to see wage expansion, uh, this reversion of or pullback from protectionist policies and uh, inflationary signals, I think the Fed would be very smart and wise to increase rates to keep inflation at bay. But inflation does not seem to be a meaningful concern, at least where we stand today.